into the streets, the homes, the lives of Iraqis living under U.S. occupation. He is a su superb journalist in the most honorable tradition of the craft. Um, and just to say for people who may not be familiar with, uh, with, with Dar Jamal and his work, uh, he went to Iraq in late 2003, um, but unlike the, other, the many other journalists who went there at the time to report on the war, Dar didn't choose to embed you know, with the Pentagon program, with the military, he didn't choose to tell the story um, of the US government as so many other journalists did. Dar instead chose to embed himself with the Iraqi people and to tell their stories and to tell the stories of the realities of the war and occupation. Um, the last thing I'll say just before I turn it over to Dar is that he's also the author of a forthcoming book, uh, Beyond the Green Zone, Dispatches from an Unembedded Journalist in Occupied Iraq. It'll be published by Haymarket Books in October 2005, but as a very special conference offer, you can actually pre-order that book tonight. You can get it 20% off. We're going to ship it before the book um, is initially released, so you'll, you'll be the first to receive it. Uh, so people should definitely get that tonight. Um, and without any further ado, here's Dar Jamal. Actually, I think technically it is correct to say that I'm occupied. I mean, we're all kind of occupied in this country right now, right? Um, well, first of all, thank you, Sarah, and thanks very much to the organizers. It, I know it's always a huge amount of work pulling these things together. Um, and specifically, I, I feel really honored to be able to give a talk at a conference that includes people like John Pilger and Jeremy Scahill and Amy Goodman Dave Zirin, Laura Flanders, Dahlia Wasfi, Camilo Mejia, IVAW folks, just to name a few. It's really, really great to be here with such a, a great group of people. Um, I want to start <clears throat> uh, talking about briefly why I went to Iraq. Um, I, I, uh, I, I actually was raised uh, in Houston, Texas, in a conservative Republican family. So my story, I, I, I want to just put it, that out there because it can kind of be used as an instance of hope. Um, <laughs> because I definitely grew up in that kind of weird environment down there where you call yourself a conservative Republican without actually knowing what that means. Um, not really knowing you know, about policies of either party or about third parties or independence or anything like this. Um, and that's kind of the environment where I came from. And I, I went to college, but uh, I did not study journalism, uh, luckily for me, uh, in college. And I, I started to get interest, more interested and in, in politically activated and, and started educating myself uh, spe more specifically after the 2000 coup. And I, I was just uh, voraciously reading the likes of uh, uh, Chomsky and, and, and then foreign reporters like John Pilger and, and Robert Fisk and, and people like this. And then as the buildup to the war with Iraq uh, really hit that fevered pitch, um, I, I knew enough to, to watch what was being done uh, in the so-called mainstream media in the United States to help sell the war to really know what I was looking at because those of us, and I, I know that this probably includes most if not every single person in this room, um, the information we were reading and getting from places like foreign news services and Le Monde and AFP and Democracy Now! and, and, and places like this uh, that we, we knew of course uh, well in advance that this war uh, had nothing to do about with weapons of mass destruction or ties to 9-11, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of, one of the things, uh, you know, the stuff I was reading and educating myself with was along the lines of uh, a quote from Samir Khader, who's a senior producer at Al Jazeera Arabic, and he said this quote uh, in that film, Control Room, and I, I've, I've met him and spoken with him personally, uh, and he's, he's said things uh, also to the effect of this quote, but I, I really like this quote in particular where he said, <clears throat> you cannot wage a war without rumors, without media, without propaganda. Any military planner who plans for a war, if he doesn't put media, propaganda, on top of his agenda, he's a bad military. With that in mind, when I slash we saw things like uh, the front page of the New York Times, here's a photocopy of it here, 
Just one example, September 8, 2002, the lead article, U.S. says Hussein intensifies quest for A-bomb parts. Written by, or co-authored, of course, by none other than the infamous Judith Miller. Um, along, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at the level of propaganda. It's, it's not even very sophisticated. It's, it's more blatant than sophisticated. But, you know, here's the lead article over here. Right there, the, the, the lead photo is a picture of uh, graffiti about 9-11 with a big American flag in memory 9-11-01. Right down here, we have Powell defends a first strike as Iraq option. I mean, this is the front page of the New York Times where they're saying is all the news that's fit to print. And that level of propaganda, not just with the New York Times, of course, all the, the major TV stations in the United States, it was really, really off the charts. And, and I was kind of, as, as the, the time of the war being launched approached and the, the level of propaganda increased proportionally, uh, so did my temper and, and my disgust and, and my outrage. And um, so, you know, with with that level of propaganda, though, as, as uh, John Pilger just said in his, his talk this afternoon, propaganda disguised as journalism, I can't think of a better example than, than uh, what the New York Times and just to name one outlet uh, was doing uh, than that. But I basically decided, well, I'd done a little bit of freelance writing, so I'm going to go to Iraq and just write about what I saw because I didn't know what else to do. So I, I think I can probably safely say I went for mental health reasons really more than anything else because if I just kept staying in the U.S. and doing the usual things and getting no results to uh, uh, try to wake folks up, uh, I was going to lose my mind. So I figured out how to go in and, and I basically started um, reporting just writing uh, uh, emails to 130 people I knew, mostly in Alaska, which is where I lived at the time, and sending them out to those 130 people uh, with photos. I had a little, you know, small camera that I bought for a couple hundred bucks, digital camera, and was sending those back. And that's what I did for the first couple of weeks before I started. Uh, uh, someone turned me on to electroniciraq.net, and then that's where I started posting, and then eventually from, that led into actually writing for, for some news outlets. But before that happened, when I, when I got into Iraq, the first trip was November 2003. And one of the first things that I saw when I, I hit the ground and, and, and literally the next day started going out with an interpreter and, and uh, talking to people to see what was going on and taking photos, and it smacked me in the face. I was there less than 48 hours and I started hearing torture stories. And again, this is the end of no November 2003. I went in November 24. Torture was everywhere. Iraqi artists were already uh, uh, doing paintings of torture. They were already creating little small sculptures of people with bags over their head and their hands behind their back and this sort of thing. And uh, you could walk down the street and just talk to Iraqis and, and hear stories. Yeah, my brother just got out of this detention prison. My brother just got out of Abu Ghraib. And, and you know, here's what he said was being done to him, uh, being held out at night. And, and you know, this is November, so it was actually fairly cool at night in Baghdad at that time. And having cold water dropped over him for hours at a time. I mean, these stories were all over the place. And, and people like uh, me, basically anyone that was going out and talking to Iraqis, i.e. unembedded reporters, we're, we're hearing these stories. Um, I met Dave Enders, who's here with us uh, right there. Uh, he was in Baghdad, and he was seeing the same thing and hearing the same thing. And I actually came across then, about five weeks into my first uh, stay in Iraq, of a, a very specific, very well-documented torture story. Um, it's a, a man by the name of Sadiq Zoman. He was detained from his home during a home raid by U.S. forces in August 2003 up in Kirkuk. He was held for a month and then dropped off at the main hospital in Tikrit by U.S. forces in a coma. Um, they basically dropped him off with uh, paperwork from a U.S. Army medic named Michael Hodges who basically wrote that the reason Sadiq Zoman was in a coma was because he uh, had, it was very, very hot and he had heat stroke, which led to a heart attack. We've done these things to try to revive him, but it's probably not gonna happen, so here he is, you get to deal with him. It was basically the gist of it. Um, I got a copy of that letter and uh, there was, 
Uh, it was interesting because I, I also, at the time, I hadn't met Zoman personally and his family yet, but I got photos and video of him, and the back of his head was bashed in. He had electrical burn marks on, uh, in his, on each palm, uh, on his genitals. Uh, one of his thumbs was broken. He had uh, uh, bruises and cuts up and down his entire body. His back was, was lashed. He had uh, bruises up and down his torso, his legs. Um, and, and I think probably the, the, the main factor, along with the uh, electrical shocks, was the back of his head being very, very bashed in by, by something, which probably may have had something to do with why he was in a coma. But none of this, not one bit of the physical evidence that we had on his body was mentioned in this report by Lieutenant Colonel Michael C. Hodges. So I had this information, I, I wrote it up, I, I just wrote it up as, uh, uh, you know, that I have these documents, I have photos, I have video, I have the report signed by the U.S. Army medic, and I emailed it to, uh, thanks to the internet, I, I got 150 emails of uh, editors and foreign news editors of all the major newspapers in the U.S., and of course 150, that goes down uh, at least somewhat deep, deeper than just the biggies. And I got, uh, you'll probably be able to guess how many responses I got, zero. Um, I didn't say I want to cover the story for you. I wasn't interested so much in that as like this information just needs to get out. Nobody even wrote back. Um, that was the level of, you know, the, the interest in uh, the, at least the U.S. journalists at the time, the more mainstream, most of the mainstream journalists at the time, in really reporting on what's going on in Iraq. And then, of course, it wasn't until uh, the end of April in 2004 when uh, I believe it was 60 Minutes 2 finally aired uh, the photos from Abu Ghraib only because they were forced to by Cy Hirsch who was about to scoop them with his article in the, in the New Yorker. Otherwise, uh, maybe they would have just waited a little bit longer before they ran them. Maybe they wouldn't have run them. Who knows? But um, just to give one example of the, the, the so-called reporting that was going on well into the occupation. I mean, it's really easy to sit here and, and, and uh, deconstruct and, and, and you know, shoot holes in the, the, the media reportage leading up to the selling of the war. But, um, I, and I'll use another example later on to underscore the fact that this, this problem has continued all the way uh, well into the occupation and continues to this day. But, you know, just to, to follow up on the torture, there's tens of thousands of detainees in, in U.S. and Iraqi custody now in Iraq. There's over 40,000, actually, that we know of, uh, likely uh, uh, substantially higher than that. Um, the situation in Iraq <clears throat> today is catastrophic. Uh, there's really no way uh, to, to t tell you here in the United States you know, we, you know, there's no car bombs going on outside, no fighting, we can have this meeting, there's electricity, there's air conditioning, um, you know, we all have uh, enough food, you know, the, the, these, these basic things that we take for granted every single day here, none of that exists in Iraq today. Um, the most important figure is that released by the, the, the uh, that which was published in the Lancet uh, this past October 11, which was that uh, the, the, the mortality survey in Iraq that found 655,000 excess deaths in Iraq. That's not 655,000 people since the invasion was launched. That's 655,000 people or 2.5 percent of the entire population of the country are dead as a direct result of the U.S.-led invasion and occupation. And I want to add to that 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 survey was conducted on the ground July a year ago. So that figure is pretty much exactly a year out of date right now. In two weeks, it'll be exactly a year out of date. Uh, this has already been uh, yet another of the, the bloodiest years of the entire occupation. So I think that you could probably safely argue that already a, a million Iraqis have, have died as a direct result of the U.S.-led invasion and occupation. And again, think about that. Here in the United States, 
2.5% of the entire population of the country have been wiped out so far, at least that number. What if 2.5% of the 300 million Americans had been wiped out in, in, in less than five years' time? How do you think that would be reported here? Instead, the Lancet report gets uh, a few mentions uh, in newspapers, and then that's it. It goes away, and it's never brought up again. Instead, we have uh, bogus figures given by groups like Iraq Body Count, these lowball counts uh, that are certainly not inclusive of, uh, inclusive of the total number of dead in Iraq, which are right in line with uh, t the types of figures that the Bush administration likes to allow out to the public. I want to talk just a little bit more about the, the infrastructure. Um, the average house in Baghdad today has one, hours, one hour out of 24 hours of electricity. Uh, unemployment is up around between 65 and 70 percent. Uh, even oil output, oil exports, are, have not for one day since the occupation began uh, been at or above pre-war levels. Uh, literally on every measurable level, the infrastructure is far worse today in Iraq than it was under the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, under the harshest economic sanctions in modern history, economic sanctions that were called genocidal by Dennis Holliday when he resigned his post with the UN. So compared to that, compared to the sanctions even, it's, it's exponentially worse on basically every level in Iraq as far as people getting their daily needs met uh, than it was <clears throat> even under the sanctions. I, an, another example I want uh, to show uh, about how, how quickly things started to go south in Iraq was um, I was hired by a, a group out of D.C. Uh, called Public Citizen. It's a, a watchdog group to do a report on Bechtel. Uh, of course, they uh, had been awarded the, the initial contract for reconstructing and, and rehabilitating the electrical plants and, and the water infrastructure. And they wanted me to do a report on what Bechtel was doing to, to uh, help out uh, with the water infrastructure, to rebuild, reconstruct uh, the, these water treatment facilities. And so I got a copy of their contract and, uh, of course, no big surprise, in their contract it's uh, almost impossible to find specific places with specific completion dates named. But I did find a few that their completion date had either just passed, and this was in January 2004, or was, was uh, soon to, like we were within a couple of months of the completion date. And these three places were Hilla, Najaf, and Diwaniya, all, all cities south of Baghdad. And so myself and uh, an interpreter named Hamoudi and uh, a freelance photographer, we took a few days and we went down to each one of these treatment plants, water treatment plants at each one of these cities and spoke with either the head or the assistant uh, en engineer uh, running each treatment plant. And the best case scenario was that one of the engineers said, yes, some, some of Bechtel's subcontractors came by here, but they just replaced the sand filters, which doesn't actually produce any more potable water. Um, the other two people basically said, when I asked them about, have you, have you seen any trace of Bechtel reconstruction or subcontractors coming here to help, uh, they basically said, Bechtel who? Um, they said if they just would give us the money and, and the, the equipment we needed and just let us do the work, we know how to do this work, we scrap things together for over 10 years during the sanctions, we could, we could have uh, stuff up and running in a couple of months, which was something that <clears throat> reporters, uh, you know, that we, we heard like a mantra all, on through the occupation. <clears throat> 